get into our story. Moxie and Roses, Chapter One, Pink Ladies. All is well at Thunder Rose Ranch. At least that's how it seems to any casual observer who visits the ranch to board their horse or get a riding lesson from the well-meaning trainers. But there's another story hidden inside the two-story historic stone and log ranch house that sits on 600 acres in Stratford, a small town in northern Dallas, Texas. As young patrons ride their paint ponies and the ranch hands shovel out the horse stalls, Pamela Cartwright, Thunder Rose's matriarch, puts the finished touching Punch Mahadigan puts the finishing touches on her makeup. I'm telling you, this is not a professional story, okay? This is just me reading my own story. Sitting at her makeup table in front of an antique oval mirror, she admires herself for the third time this morning. Oh, honey, you're going to make them all purr today, she thinks, imagining herself as she used to when she walked out onto the stage at the Texas Beauty Queen pageants. You are going to win every title out there. What she forgets sometimes is those stages were lit for her over 20 years ago, and now the only stages she's on are the ones where she wins awards for Horse Ranch of the Year or Best Horse Training Academy of the South. No one cares about her makeup there. Amber, Pamela's 19-year-old daughter, enters her mother's bedroom to ask for money, but sees her mother lost herself in front of the mirror. Oh, forget it, Amber thinks to herself. I'll never get her to really hear me when she's primping herself like that. Amber decides to go out to the horse stalls to see if Diego has gotten there yet. Diego Escamillo works at Thunder Rose as a part-time ranch hand every Monday and Tuesday so Luke and Billy, the full-time hands, can have time off. Amber smooths her long black hair, or blonde hair, <laughs> my God, and adds a spritz of bombshell perfume that her mother brought for her on her last trip to Paris before bounding down the winding staircase of the main house and out the back door. It's a short walk down a manicured path to the stables, and when she arrives, there's only the whinny of the horses and the crack of the trainer's dressage whip on the air. In downtown Dallas, Moxie Montego sits on her small patio, glad that it's her night off from work. Moxie dances at the posh men's club Pink Lady. The club is hidden on the top floor of a high-end Dallas high-rise and is frequented by invitation only. Diamond Martinez, who runs the club, enjoys the privacy that is only given after favors have been provided to all the right people. Diamond hired Moxie after meeting her at an Italian fusion restaurant where Moxie was working the door. Diamond knew sex appeal when she saw it, and she also knew that all her clients would love to see Moxie up on stage. Diego Escamilla, Diamond's niece, also works the bar at Pink Lady. He occasionally needs to muscle out some drunk guy who's not observing the rules, but usually the tall, muscular Diego just gets to work behind the bar and enjoy the scenery. He doesn't know what he likes better, watching half-naked girls all night, or the peace and serenity at Thunder Rose on his days off, so he chooses to do both. It's Monday morning, and Diego is recovering from last night at Pink Lady. One of the girls got sick and had to leave mid-show, so that left more work for the others, who celebrated the end of the night at 3 a.m. by having a tequila shot contest. Diego, not wanting to be left out of the fun, had joined them and was suffering the effects now. He did have one success last night. Moxie had finally agreed to come visit him at Thunder Rose. He had been trying to get her out there for a while now. Now Diamond had very strict rules for her girls at Pink Lady, and one of them was that they didn't date the help or the patrons. The last time a girl had broken this rule, it had erupted into a huge fight one night, one that Diego wasn't able to handle alone. He had ended up in the hospital with broken ribs and a concussion after trying to separate Deanna and her patron turned boyfriend after the boyfriend found Deanna showing more of herself than he was comfortable with. But Moxie and Diego were just friends, and what his Aunt Diamond didn't know wouldn't hurt her, he thought. He just wanted Moxie to see how peaceful and serene it was at Thunder Rose. Moxie's head was spinning from too much tequila the night before, but she was also smiling because she had finally agreed to see Diego outside of Pink Lady. 
She knew it was forbidden, but she really liked him and hoped he might like her too. He spoke highly of this ranch he worked at, and she was excited to see the horses and take a ride. She used to ride when she was little. Her father was a horse wrangler in one of Mexico's largest rodeo circuits and would let her ride the gentle ponies on the weekends when her grandparents would take her to see him. Moxie decided a cool shower would help wash away the cobwebs in her brain, so she headed inside to get ready. Chapter 2 Pamela and Edgar Pamela Cartwright didn't know what to do next as she stood up from her makeup table. Her chef, Marguerite, was already in the kitchen preparing breakfast, and she handed Pamela a steaming mug of her favorite coffee as she entered the kitchen. Sipping the strong brew, Pamela decided to go out to the stables to double-check on the horses. She had already been out once early that morning after hearing a commotion coming from out back. She was deep in sleep and had been awakened by the tense whinnying of the horses. This was more than a little anxiety, she thought, as she could hear them kicking their stalls from all the way up in her bedroom. She thought maybe Luke had forgotten to bolt up the stable doors and some raccoon or, God forbid, larger animal had made its way inside. The horses could be spooked by almost anything, but when she had made it out to the barn, she, she didn't see a thing. The stable door was locked, and when she went inside, there was nothing. But the horses were spooked just the same, and this was the third time this month. It was time to call Edgar, she thought, a little too excitedly. Edgar River Whitetail was Thunder Rose's equivalent to a horse whisperer, although he wouldn't knowingly accept such a title. Edgar lived up on the Oklahoma Plains and rode his big Appaloosa down to Thunder Rose to spend the winters there. No one knew quite where he lived, but it was rumored he had a small cabin by a river and that he lived there alone. Edgar liked to bunk with the horses when he was at Thunder Rose, much to Pamela's dismay. She would have preferred to have him in her bed, but she figured he might warm to that in time. Although he didn't show her the slightest bit of amorous attention, she was convinced that deep down he really lusted for her just like all the others. Pamela was forever trying to find excuses to be around Edgar when he was there, but he preferred to ride out in the open range, taking a different horse each time. Pamela paid him handsomely, as he was the only one who could tame or heal the most unruly or sickened horse. She didn't know how he did it. She just knew that whatever he did worked. Word had gotten around Stratford that Pamela had herself a magical horse healer, and everyone who owned a horse or ran a horse business, which was pretty much everyone in town, wanted to see what Edgar had to offer. But Pamela didn't like to share and was keeping him all to herself, avoiding anyone who wanted to come by to drop off their troubled horse to, quote-unquote, the whisperer, as they called him, to give it a look over. Edgar knew full well what Pamela was up to, but he accepted that this was just her way, and the joy he got from being at the ranch outweighed the petty stuff that came up between him. <clears throat> and he had 600 acres to escape into, so it wasn't hard to avoid her. He knew that she thought she fancied him, but he knew the real truth behind her so-called affection. One day he hoped to share that truth with her. Pamela and Edgar had met at a horse auction up in Oklahoma when she was first starting out. The then, the then, 25-year-old Pamela was instantly drawn to the young Edgar, who was there to buy a pony for himself, after losing the last one in a trade he made with a fellow soul brother. He had received a year's worth of bison for the horse and figured that it was Jack's time to go to a new home anyway. He used to believe in keeping a horse for life, but that was before the accident. It had been a lazy summer afternoon, and he had decided to take his favorite pony Matilda out on the range for an overnight ride. He was 19 and was just ready to show himself that he could do this horse healing thing. The overnight ride was a sort of vision quest as he sought the approval of his gods and the thunder beings for his healing work. <clears throat> he had saddled up Matilda, and they spent the entire day riding up to Cracker Ridge to the point where he would spend the night. Cracker Ridge got its name from the cracked rocks that lined the ridge. It was a tough, steep ride to the top, but the view and the satisfaction of making the point were the reason he chose to ride there in the first place. It had started to rain as an unexpected storm blew in, and halfway to the top, Matilda had slipped 
and her forefoot had gotten caught in a crack, badly turning the pastern right above the hoof. The horse had groaned in pain and gone down right there. He couldn't get her back up, and he could see the leg was badly broken. He'd had Matilda since she was a foal, and the sight of her in so much pain made his heart ache. He knew what he had to do, but the pain in his heart felt like it was piercing his soul. He had taken on an old code as his when he had completed his training, learning his healing art from the best of the best, Moon Eagle. The code, as with any healing modality, was something to the effect of doing no harm. But he could see that in this situation the code must be broken. There was no way Matilda was going to make it. He could feel it in her when he ran his hands above her body, as the healer in him had taken over. Even she knew she wasn't going to make it. So he had done the only thing he knew how to do, and that was that. The vision quest had turned into an initiation of sorts, and he had left Matilda's body and walked the rest of the way up to the point. He cursed the ridge, God, and everything else he could think of as tears streamed down his face. And as he sat overnight up on the cold, dark ridge, what was supposed to have been a celebration of his power turned to a dark night of the soul. Of course he wanted to continue healing, but he would never keep a horse for longer than he felt necessary. When young Pamela had first seen Edgar at the auction, she had caught her breath. He was, she thought, possibly the sexiest and most powerful-looking man she had ever seen at over six feet tall and lanky, with a long, silky black hair under a cowboy hat that had an eagle feather pointing out of the brim. He was wearing a medicine bag around his waist, and his denim shirt was open, exposing his chest, and a tattoo of something Pamela couldn't quite make out, but she had definitely wanted to get closer and try. Edgar had noticed Pamela, too, but not for the reason she thought. He had wondered why such a beautiful woman was hiding behind so much makeup and pretension. He thought if she could only wash off all the lipstick and face paint, that she would possibly be the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. He wanted to walk right up and tell her that, but usually his direct method of communication didn't go over well with most folks that didn't know him. So he decided to keep quiet and just observe. He noticed she was buying quite a few horses and all quality choices. He wondered what such a young girl was going to do with all those ponies and had decided to strike up a conversation. They had instantly clicked and had shared a tobacco pipe together after the auction ended. He was surprised that she had accepted the pipe and thought maybe she was just being polite. But she told him that her father had been a civil engineer in charge of overseeing the development of native lands and had done his share of peace pipe smoking. She had secretly taken his pipe on more than one occasion, as the small habit made her feel powerful, knowing she was able to hide something from her father, who always thought she was the perfect princess. Pamela had gotten dizzy from all the smoke and a little tipsy from the sips out of Edgar's flask. She opened up to him a little too easily, he thought back then, sharing that she was fresh out of a nasty divorce from Amber's father, Quint. Quint was the son of a multimillionaire and had fallen hard for the 18-year-old beauty queen. However, after two years of marriage and the baby Amber, Quint had left her for a bouncy stripper he met one weekend in Vegas. Pamela's end of the deal had been Thunder Rose Ranch, winning it in the divorce only if she would give up any and all other rights to Quint's money. She had agreed and now was the owner of a 600-acre ranch that had a spooky backstory. Pamela had offered Edgar a job on the spot when she heard he worked with horses. She didn't need to know his qualifications. She just knew she wanted him around, and she could see by the way he handled his horse that he was a natural with them. Her father had told her stories of the native healers he had seen on his trips into the Nebraska and Montana tribal lands, and now she was infatuated with having found a healer of her own. She wanted him all to herself, asking him to move into the ranch to oversee the horses. Edgar, not always seduced by money, unless the occasion warranted, decided to pick Pamela up on her offer on his terms. He would spend most of the year in Oklahoma working the ranches he knew there, and they would come down to Thunder Rose and spend the winters there. Pamela, not wanting to lose him, accepted that offer. That had been 17 years ago, and he had been coming faithfully every winter. 
Although it wasn't quite winter yet, Pamela was unnerved by unexplained events that had started within the past several months. Some would describe them as ghostly, but Pamela wasn't sure about that. On a few occasions, Billy had seen a figure in the fog that hadn't responded when he called out to it. This was over in the back pasture, and he had come back from his fence inspection and gone right inside the gatehouse without saying a word. Then Luke had been out on the tractor bringing in hay late one afternoon, and someone or something had run right in front of him and into the trees. He couldn't quite make out what it was, and he didn't believe in ghosts, so he wasn't accepting that from anyone. Then Amber had heard strange noises coming from the gatehouse one night. It sounded like bells tolling, but that was impossible. The only bell on the ranch was the dinner bell that Marguerite would ring for meals, and that was way up at the main house. This sounded like church bells tolling and scared Amber so much she couldn't go near the gatehouse for a week. So Pamela decided that winter or not, she was going to ask Edward to come down early. She didn't think he would decline, but she never knew what mood she might catch him in when she called. He didn't have a cell phone or a home phone for that matter. She had to call Flank's general store at Broken Arrow and leave a message for him. It was really important that Tim, the clerk, would send his son down to whatever ranch Edgar was working at to deliver the message. If it wasn't urgent, then the message was delivered when Edgar came into the store once a week for supplies. Pamela decided this was definitely an urgent message and didn't care if Edgar agreed with that or not. He simply must come down now and help figure out what was going on. She knew if anyone could, it was him. She had seen him on many occasions work with all manner of things that he called tools, but to her looked like feathers and bones and who knows what else. She heard him speak of his helping spirits and guides and how he could clear negative energy and bring healing energy down from the heavens. She really felt like Thunder Rose needed some healing energy right about now. She called the general store and left an urgent message with Tim. Please come as soon as you can. We have something here that needs your immediate attention, Pam. Tim agreed to send his son right away for Edgar, who was working at the Elliott Ranch, herding the steer with the others in a weekend roundup. Then Pamela was left to wait for Edgar to contact her, or in some cases he would just show up. It would take a while for him to ride down to Stratford on Opal, his newest pony, but she was willing to wait. She only hoped he arrived before something more sinister happened. Chapter 3, The Screech Thunder Rose was eerily quiet that afternoon, but soon the rumble of Diego's big ram truck filled the air as it rolled in through the ornate iron entrance gate. He parked out by the stables in the area reserved for the ranch hands and hired help. When he got out, he could sense that something wasn't quite right, but he couldn't put his finger on it. Just then, the back door of the main house opened, and Amber ran out to meet him. Diego, you made it. I didn't think you were coming today. It's getting so late, she said, flipping her long, blonde hair back over her shoulder. She thought this made her look sexy, but Diego thought she looked like a little girl. He knew full well that she had the hots for him, but he wasn't about to jeopardize this job in order to sleep with the young daughter of his employer. Plus, he had plenty of young beauties to choose from if he ever wanted to. But right now, he was fixed on his outing with Moxie, who should have already arrived. Hi, Amber. How you doing, ma'am? He said in his most polite Texas drawl. If he thought the ma'am part was going to turn her off, he was wrong. It only made her feel more enamored that such a hunky cowboy was paying attention to her. Hey, let's you and me ride out to the grove, she said in her best come-and-get-me voice, hoping he would notice. Maybe later, he said unaffected. I I'm waiting for a friend to get here. Oh, do I know him? She said, clearly not getting the picture. No, you don't know her, and she should be here by now. Excuse me while I call her, he said, pulling out his cell and hoping that his emphasis on the word her would register. Well, I'll be around if you want to take that ride later, she said, trying to appear unaffected, but realizing that he had asked another girl to meet him there. She went inside and heading upstairs, posting herself in the front window so she could see this girl when she drove up. Just as Diego was dialing Moxie, his cell rang. Great minds think alike, he thought, as he saw Moxie's name come up on this phone. Hey, girl, where are you? I was getting concerned. Are you lost? He said, hoping that she wasn't. It was getting later in the day, and he had already arrived way beyond when he should have been there. 
If Pamela found out he was late, she would dock his pay, and that wouldn't go over well all the way around. I think I'm on the right road, but my Garmin stopped calculating when I turned off the main road, Moxie said, trying to navigate her sleek Mustang convertible down the dirt road. I, I just passed a sign that said Thunder Rose ahead one mile, so it, it looks like I'm almost there, she said. Just come through the main gates. You can't miss it. It's got a huge ornate arch with roses and thunder and horses on it. Drive down the main entrance and you should see my truck around the side. You can park by me, he said, excited that she was almost there. He had never seen her on her day off, and he wasn't sure what to expect. He was only used to seeing her in scantily clad outfits, or usually with almost nothing on at all. He hoped she had dressed for a ride and not for pole dancing. Within a few minutes, he could see the dust rising on the road outside the gate. And then the white Mustang drove through the main gate and up to where his truck was at. He could see her waving to him from inside the car. The Mustang growled to a stop, and Moxie took a minute to gather her bag and sell before opening the door. Diego, the gentleman that he was, walked to her side of the car and opened the driver door, holding his hand out so she could get out with a little help. It was always challenging to unfold from those small cars, he thought. Diego, it's so good to see you, Moxie said, giving him a quick hug. Thank you so much for inviting me. Diego took a minute to respond as he took in the girl before him. She was perfectly attired in tight blue jeans, a cotton button-down shirt exposing her cleavage, and brand new rope of boots. She had a small diamond necklace on, which was last year's Christmas gift from Diamond Martinez. "'You look amazing,' Diego said politely. "'I'm glad you made it. I've got so much to show you. I think you're really going to love it here,' he said in what appeared to be one long run-on sentence. "'Cool it, cowboy,' she said jokingly. "'Can I get something to drink first? I'm still parched from all the tequila last night.' she said, holding a hand to her throat to emphasize that. Aware of my manners, he said, let's go into the kitchen. Marguerite, the chef, always had some fresh lemonade on chill. Even though it was early November, the heat of the sun had warmed up the day considerably, and lemonade would be just the answer. Now this scene was being taken in by Amber upstairs, and she wasn't happy with what she saw. She had never met Moxie before, but she felt sure after seeing her body and so much cleavage that she wasn't going to like her at all, and she vowed to do everything in her power to catch Diego first. Then just as Diego and Moxie were pouring a tall glass of lemonade, a high-pitched screech sounded outside. What in the world is that, Diego said, placing his glass down and heading out the back door with Moxie following. By the time he reached the stables, the horses were in an uproar, turning around in their stalls and neighing to each other with anxiety. That sounded like it came from the woods over there, Diego said, pointing towards the direction of the pecan tree grove. But the woods and pasture area were strangely quiet now, as they looked around for whatever could have made the sound. Amber had also run outside and bumped into the pair as they were coming back from the training pen area. We didn't see anything, did you? Diego said to Amber. But Amber was transfixed on Moxie and bound on setting her straight. Diego was to be her man and no one else's. Well, hello, I don't think we've met, Amber said in her best rich Texas girl accent. I'm Amber, Diego's good friend, and you are? She said with her hands on her hips. Hi, I'm Moxie, she said, fully understanding where this girl was coming from. She had seen it way too many times at the club, when a girl got completely turned on by a guest and wanted him all to herself. There was a sense of competition in her voice that completely turned Moxie off. She could be really likable, Moxie thought, if she would only let up a little bit. Just then the screech pierced the air again, and they all jumped at the sound of it. Let's go calm, calm the horses down. I need to talk to Miss Pamela about this, Diego said. Amber, is your mom home? Yes, yeah, she's out on the range right now. Though, but she, she'll be back soon, Amber said, looking out towards the pastures. They were all spooked by this otherworldly sound and hoped that Pamela was okay. Diego knew that Thunder Rose had a strange past, but he wasn't sure of all the details. But whatever was causing that sound was bone-chilling, and he hoped they could get to the source so everyone could calm down. This was ruining his ride with Moxie, and he was losing daylight. 
Ten minutes later, as they were watering the horses and working to keep them calm, Pamela rode up in a rush, her long blonde hair flying out from under her pink Stetson. She had to work hard to stop the black gelding from crashing into the stable doors. Whoa, Onyx, easy boy, she said, trying to sound calm as she reined the big horse in. Diego could see she was having trouble and that the horse, in his anxiety, might easily try to throw Pamela off. So he moved quickly but calmly over to them and grabbed Onyx's halter. Easy, boy, easy, what's got into you, he said, as he moved his hands slowly and rhythmically over the horse's forehead and muzzle. Onyx slowly calmed, and Pamela was able to dismount. We didn't see anything, she said. It was it was just that horrible sound. Did you hear it? She said, smoothing her hair down and patting the dust off of her. Yes, we all did, Diego said, realizing that Pamela hadn't been introduced to Moxie yet. Miss Pamela, this is my friend Moxie. It's, it's her day off work today, and I thought she might like to relax with a ride. Pamela eyed the girl with the slight disdain she carried when she was up against younger and more vital women who might try to threaten her sense of inner power and beauty. She knew she was getting older and that young men like Diego weren't much for fancying a 40-something woman over a bright and shiny 20-year-old. Well, hello, I'm Mac. I'm Moxie. I'm, I'm Pamela Cartwright. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello, Moxie. I'm Pamela Cartwright. It's sure nice to meet you, she lied as she took Moxie's hand while eyeing that cleavage. I'm sure you'll love it here. Make yourself at home, hun. Thank you, ma'am, Moxie said, feeling a little sense of jealousy coming from the Cartwright ladies. But that was nothing new to her, so she tried to stay focused on her main reason for coming out in the first place. I hope you'll still be able to ride, she said to Diego. What with that strange sound and all? She said, moving her attention away from the ladies and back to Diego. I'm game to go into the grove and check it out if you are, he said to Moxie, forgetting that he still wasn't sure how well she could ride. I'm in, Moxie said excitedly. Let's saddle up. Both Pamela and Amber rolled their eyes at each other. Amber, can I see you inside, Pamela said, giving her daughter the eyes that meant she wanted to talk to her privately. We'll see you two later, she said to Diego and Moxie, as she moved Amber towards the main house. What was that, Moxie said, as the mother and daughter disappeared out of range. Well, one thinks she's still a beauty queen, and the other wishes she was, he said. Don't mind them. They'll come around. He said, more interested in the ride than the pretentious Cartwright women. They made their way into the stables to get their horses and chose the two that looked like they had calmed the most from earlier. Here, you can ride Lilac, and I'll take Chestnut, he said, saddling them up. Lilac was really Amber's favorite horse, but he didn't think she would notice since she was so focused on herself at the moment. By the way, I know you can, uh, you said you can ride, but what's your experience level, he asked. As they mounted their horses, Moxie proceeded to tell him about how she grew up on the streets of Laredo, Mexico. Her father had taught her how to ride horses. He was a horse wrangler in one of Mexico's biggest rodeos, and Moxie would go see him every weekend. Her mother had died when she was two years old, and her father had tried to bring her up, but she spent more time on the streets with her friends than in school. She promised him she would live a good life, and she really tried. She'd even considered performing in the rodeo, but her father died suddenly one day after being gored by one of the bulls, and after that, Moxie couldn't stay there. So she moved to the States in hopes of a better life. So needless to say, I can ride very well, she said, turning her horse and galloping off. Just try and catch me. Diego didn't need to be told twice as he spurred his horse on in order to catch up to her as she headed towards the grove. Be careful, we still don't know what's in there, he yelled, trying to get her attention. I bet it's just a really large screech owl, she turned and yelled back, continuing towards the trees. As she entered the tree line, the sun faded out to a dappled light as the shade canopy of large trees covering the ground. It was strangely quiet, and she sh oh my god, tongue tied. It was strangely quiet, and she slowed Lilac to a walk, waiting for Diego to catch up. As he moved his horse up beside hers, she turned to him and smiled. "I beat you," she said, laughing. "I didn't know we were racing," he said, noticing how he really liked to see her bouncing on ahead of him. Anyway, he didn't have to win—at least not in that way. He thought to himself. See, there's nothing in here, she said, dismounting from Lilac and tying the horse's reins to a small tree trunk. Let's look around. Have you been in here before? She asked as she walked around looking up in the trees. 
Yes, many times, he said, tying his horse and moving up to where she was. It, it's dark and quiet, but I've never seen anything sinister before, he said, feeling Moxie's body close to his. It's going to be dark soon, so we shouldn't stay long, he said, feeling a little like he wanted to stay longer if he meant he could hang out with her here. Yeah, it's getting cold, too, she said, holding her arms around her, and I left my jacket in the car. Well, you're in luck, because I have mine, he said, going over to Chestnut and taking the jacket out of the saddlebag. He offered it to her, wrapping it around her shoulders. He could feel the heat of her body next to his, but he also saw the face of his Aunt Diamond shaking her finger at him in admonition. Thank you, Diego, Moxie said, turning to him. You're always such a gentleman, and I really appreciate that. I know it must be hard for you to stay unattached to any of us girls at the club. Well, that sealed it, he thought. She expected him to be an unattached gentleman, and so that is what he would be. Just then, a loud, ear-piercing screech sounded from somewhere deep in the grove. Both of them jumped, and Moxie lost her footing and fell into Diego's arms. It was all he could do to help her catch her footing without pulling her onto him. Easy, brother, he thought to himself, as they both regained their composure. We've got to get to the bottom of this, he said, laughing nervously. Yeah, definitely, Moxie said, trying to fight off the feeling of his hard body against hers and realizing he was talking about the sounds and not her. It's getting too dark now, and our, and our horses probably want to get out of here. Maybe you can come back, or we can come back another time, he said, looking into her eyes. I, I would love that, she said, moving her eyes away from his electric stare. Back at the main house, Pamela and Amber were deep in conversation. How many times do I need to tell you, Amber, that it's not polite to invite someone and not spend time with them? Why aren't you outside with our guest? Pamela asked. Mom, she's not my guest. She's Diego's friend of all things. And, and did you see that cleavage? What is she trying to prove? She said haughtily. Nonetheless, she's a guest at our ranch, and we must be civil at least. Plus, you can find out what she's really doing here. You know, investigate a little. Ha haven't I taught you anything? Amber didn't like when her mother spoke to her like that, but she complied, knowing there was a healthy trust fund waiting for her when she turned 21. Amber left her mother and went to the kitchen to grab some of Marguerite's scones, a peace offering she thought happily to herself. As she hurried down the back path, she heard their voices down by the stables. Well, it sure was nice of you to invite me today, she heard Moxie say. It was nothing. Sorry we got a late start, she heard Diego's voice. Promise me you'll come back another time. We don't only have to see each other at the club, you know. She heard him say a little more husky now. What club, Amber thought to herself. She was going to find out how these two really knew each other. She didn't know a lot about Diego, but she knew she liked him, and that was enough. But her mother would never let her take the relationship further if she couldn't find out more about what he did when he wasn't at the ranch. And at that thought, she emerged from the path out to where Diego and Moxie were standing next to each other and a little too close for her liking. Well, what are you two up to, she said in her bouncy voice. I brought scones if you're hungry. That sounds good, Diego said. Thanks, Amber. They each took a scone and in between bites, Amber got serious. So, Moxie, what do you do for a living, she said innocently. I'm a professional dancer down in Dallas, Moxie said, not really concerned about how she appeared to this girl. She had learned a long time ago to be proud of what she did and not hide herself from others. However, she didn't know how much the Cartwrights knew about Diego's life, so she stopped and left it at that. Not satisfied at that, Amber added, added how do you and Diego know each other? Amber, kiss and tell is over for now, Diego said, looking sideways at Moxie. Moxie needs to get home now. She doesn't know her way back very well, and it'll be dark soon, don't you, Moxie? I actually wish I could stay longer, Moxie said to his surprise. We never did find out the cause of those sounds, and I would love to go investigate later tonight. Diego was just as surprised as Amber, who was a little faster thinking than Diego on this one. I feel a camp out coming on, she said excitedly. Come on, Moxie, Diego, wouldn't that be fun? We could pitch tents out in the pasture and you could listen for your silly sounds, she said, proud of herself for finding a way to keep Diego close to her overnight under the guise of being Moxie's new friends. It will be so much fun. What do you say, you two? Diego thought it was the best idea he had heard in a long time. If he could keep Amber busy, he would have Moxie all to himself. I think it's a great idea, he said, looking at Moxie. What do you say, girl? 
Well, I didn't really plan for an overnight trip, she said, knowing full well she could survive with the bare minimum, and had done so on many occasions before she had met Diamond Martinez. I'm game. It sounds like fun, she said, smiling innocently at them both. Chapter 4. Camp Out. Well, then it's settled then, said Amber. Diego, we have tents in the garage, and I can go ask Marguerite to whip us up some campfire food. She knows how to make a great vegan chili, Amber said, moving off towards the house, clear in her mind of just how her plan this night would unfold. She knew the art of getting a guy to notice her, and Diego would be no exception. Moxie or not, she was going to have Diego tonight, and under the stars at her ranch. He wouldn't be able to resist her, she thought. Meanwhile, Moxie went to her car and started searching for anything that could be used on a nighttime camping trip. She wasn't too lucky, though, only coming up with a pair of white thigh-high boots and a G-string unitard. Well, that definitely won't work in this weather, she laughed to herself. She realized she wasn't alone as she felt someone behind her, and Diego was looking over her shoulder and nodding approvingly. Are you going to wear that tonight? he joked. She didn't even have to answer that with anything other than by turning around and ribbing him in the chest. They laughed, keeping her secret together from the Cartwright woman, who would be all over it if they found out that Diego worked at a club that exploited women for men's pleasure. I think I have something in the truck for you, and I'm sure Amber has stuff you can wear, he said, rubbing his ribs where her elbow had jabbed him and realizing how feisty she really was. This girl can really take care of herself, he thought, watching her move back towards the horse stalls. What he didn't know was that this ranch was bringing out something in Moxie. It was something she couldn't quite put her finger on, but she had felt it when she first drove through the main gate. It was like she had been here before, although she knew she never had. The horses felt so familiar to her, and the woods felt like they were calling her into what she didn't know. She felt it in her bones, and she decided that she wanted to explore further in the darkness to see what was going on. Diego appeared with a large denim jacket that he offered to Moxie. She accepted it gladly as the temperature continued to drop. They stood together, looking out towards the sun that was slowly slipping beneath the horizon. I better get these tents set up, he said. It's going to be too dark to see soon. Come with me to the garage and we'll see what we can find in there, he said to Moxie. Okay, and I can help, and then I want to explore the ranch. Let's see if we can find some flashlights, she said, moving in step with him with both their boots crunching in unison on the dirt path to the garage. Inside the main house, Amber was planning out the evening in her mind. First we can eat and then do some stargazing and campfire stories. Then it's lights out, but not before I pretend that I'm scared and go to Diego in his tent. She went to her room to gather up the things she thought they would need for her love fest. Now what she failed to admit to herself was she had never really been with a man like that before. Diego would be her first, and it would be perfect. She would steal him right out from under Moxie's nose. She wouldn't have to tell her mother anything unless she wanted the lecture, the one about waiting for the rich Prince Charming to show up on his perfect horse and sweep Amber away to live in riches somewhere. She didn't want to wait for that. What if it never happened and she grew old and never found this so-called Prince? She had seen enough of Diego to know that he was what she thought she wanted for now. She pulled out her duffel bag and added some sheer pajamas, somehow forgetting that it would be quite chilly outside tonight. On second thought, she threw in a pair of jeans and a chunky sweater, a flashlight, her iPad, and a condom that her friend Cindy had given her at senior prom last year. Amber had never gotten the chance to use it, although she had tried to entice Cal, the hunky son of the Hambertons from Broken G Ranch. He was on the football team and always spoke gently to Amber when they were around each other. She thought for sure he would ask her to the prom, but her bubble burst when he decided to go with Jamie Clouton, homecoming queen, instead, and her hopes of breaking her virginity, which she thought of as more a vow of chastity that her mother had made her agree to, were dashed. But not tonight. She was going to do everything in her power to bed this older guy, who she secretly thought about even when he wasn't around. This must be love, she thought to herself. Diego and Moxie had found the tents and a few sleeping bags that they carried out to the pasture area. He found a flat spot that was halfway between the stables and the woods and where they could safely have a fire. He thought about getting closer to the trees for some shelter, but not knowing the cause of that bone-chilling sound coming from within the grove, he decided against it. With Moxie's help, he quickly had the tents set up and had a small fire going. 
Amber appeared right on time to avoid the work with her duffel bag and a container of treats that Marguerite had put together. Hi, guys. Anyone want some veggie skewers? We can roast them over the fire. Marguerite's going to bring us some dinner food in a little bit, she said, setting everything down. Diego, which one is your tent? She said, knowing she wanted the closest one next to his. I'm over here, and this is Moxie's. We took the first choice since we set them up, he said. Amber moved into her tent with a huff since it was actually the furthest away. No worries, she thought to herself. My plan will still work out perfectly. They spent the next few hours roasting veggies, vegan hot dogs, and veggie burgers over the fire. Marguerite had also made them her famous chili and cornbread with s'mores for dessert. They were full and happy as they laughed at silly campfire stories they each made up. The stars were out everywhere, and the evening was relaxed and spontaneous. When they started to wind down, Moxie decided it was time to explore. Hey, I want to go into the woods. Do you all want to join me in there? She said, picking up her flashlight. Diego was concerned for her safety, but he really didn't want to go in there. He was actually hoping he could get her into his tent instead. Come on, are you both too scared, she said, moving away from them. She put the flashlight up to her face. There is no such thing as ghosts or whatever you think might be making those sounds, and I'm going to prove it. Come on, Moxie, everybody's tired. Let's just call it a night, Diego. Thought this might stay her, but he realized they normally worked all night, and this was their time, albeit safe in the club atop a Dallas high-rise, rather than blundering around in a dark, cold forest. Come catch me then, she laughed and ran into the forest entrance, jiggling her light around and making funny ghost sounds. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Damn it, girl. Diego didn't know if he was more pissed, scared, or intrigued by this. But male hormones took over and he decided to follow. Amber, you don't have to go if you don't want to, he said, realizing Amber was already on her feet and ready to follow, although she was moving very slowly. Diego, I'm not sure about this. I'm scared, she said, realizing this might be her chance. As she moved closer to him, I I'll go, but only if you promise to stay right by me, she said, gazing up at him as the stars lit her big blue eyes. Okay, let's go, he half promised, knowing that if something happened to Moxie, he would leave Amber's side in a second. They both walked towards the grove entrance, and then they heard it. A blood-curdling scream that pierced the night like a knife. It was coming from deep inside the wood, too far for Moxie to have gotten to, Diego thought as he broke into a run. The scream came once more, and then everything was quiet. What the? Moxie, are you okay? He yelled into the darkness, shining his flashlight into the trees ahead. Hey, you're supposed to stay with me, Amber yelled after him. She was too afraid to follow him in and stood at the grove entrance, shaking. Diego, you promised, she yelled after him. He ran a few steps further in and bumped right into Moxie coming back towards him. Did you hear that, she said, breathing heavily. What is going on around here? I went a little further, but I didn't see anything. It's pitch black in there, she said, as her breath, frosty now in the evening chill, enveloped them. He could feel the heat of her body, and it was all he could do not to pull her into him, but he waited. He actually wanted her to make the first move. That way, he would know for sure that it was a mutual thing. Moxie felt him next to her, but as much as she liked him, something was holding her back. Not here, not like this, she thought to herself. So she started to move back towards the grove entrance, but not before stumbling on something in the undergrowth. I found something, she said, bending down to shine her light on it. She felt around in the pine needles and touched what felt like a large square picking it up and shining her light on it. She saw it was a small wooden box, devoid of any markings except a small cross on the lid. What is it, he said, holding it. She said, <laughs> what is it, she said, holding it up to Diego. Let's get back to camp where we can have more light. Plus, I don't want to be here if that scream happens again, he said, taking her hand to help lead her out. She held his hand like a small child being led, and as they reached the grove entrance, they found Amber standing there looking more scared than anything. Diego, you said you wouldn't leave me, she said, sounding disappointed. We found something, he said, brushing past her and not acknowledging what felt to him like pouting. Silly girl, he thought to himself. They gathered around the fire and Moxie held up the box in the firelight. The small brass cross was affixed to the top and had 
tarnished, being left out in the elements for who knows how long. She passed it around so they could each look at it. Diego shook it lightly, and they could hear something rattling around inside. Looks really old, Amber said, running her fingers along the cross. A chill went down her spine, and she quickly handed the box back to Moxie. I'm going to open it, Moxie said, looking for something she could use to pry open the lid of the old box. Here, use this, Diego said, handing her a bottle opener he had retrieved from one of the bags that Marguerite had sent. Moxie took the opener and used it to gently pry around the opening where the lid fit into the box. She could see the edges at the top coming up, and it appeared to be almost open when the terrible high-pitched scream sounded from inside the wood again. It surprised Moxie, and she dropped the box to the ground. Forgetting about it, she grabbed her flashlight and got up running back towards the wood. That's it. I'm going to get to the bottom of this, she said, running too far ahead now for Diego and Amber to hear her. Moxie, wait, De Amber said. De Amber. Holy. Diego said, picking up his flashlight and running in after her with Amber close behind. She knew she didn't want to be left standing alone if whatever it was appeared. Moxie ran towards where she thought she heard the sound coming from. Her feet moved stealthily over pine needles, and with her light shining down towards the ground, she ran and hopped over small branches and holes made in the ground by small animals. And then, after several minutes, she reached a clearing. She could no longer hear Diego and Amber behind her, and it felt like she had entered another place entirely. The forest was lit up around her by all the stars, but beyond that was complete darkness. And then she saw it. A small glow coming from inside the base of a large tree. What could that be, she thought to herself. The warm glow almost beckoned her to move closer, and she did, putting her hand out in front of her. Whatever it was seemed to be drawing her in. She was transfixed, and she felt herself going numb like she was dreaming. But this wasn't a dream. This was real, and here she was all alone in the forest. Then she couldn't move at all. She was stuck exactly where she was, and then she saw it. The glow moved up and out of the base of the tree and grew higher and higher up towards the top of the trees. The glow began to form itself into the shape of a woman, and the woman began to speak to her. Hello, Moxie. My name is Mary, and I am here to bring you the news that you must share with everyone you encounter, for it is through you that I will spread my word and that of our Holy Father and Lord. Moxie, through you we will be made known again. The light felt comforting, yet Moxie couldn't breathe. She was transfixed and transfigured, and she began to hyperventilate. She was scared, yet not scared. She could feel the Holy Mother's presence holding her in a comforting embrace. Yet she didn't know what she was supposed to do or say. This had to be a dream. Yes, that was it. She had passed out in the woods, or better yet, she was asleep inside her tent, and this was all one big weird dream. I have given you a gift, Moxie, and soon you will know that this is no dream. For now, I bid you goodbye, dear one, the vision said, slowly fading out. Moxie dropped to her knees and prayed to God for forgiveness and mercy. Surely this was the ghost of the forest. It couldn't be what she thought it really was. There was no way the Divine Mother would come to her. She was a stripper in a men's club, for goodness sake, not some saintly figure like she had read about in her grandmother's Bible. As she was regaining her composure and hoping she would wake up warm in her sleeping bag, Diego and Amber broke through the brush and ran right into her, kneeling on the ground. Moxie, are you hurt? What are you doing down there? Diego said, helping her to her feet. I'm fine, she said, still in shock from the vision and its words to her. I'm just cold and I need to get back to camp. Amber, who had gotten there last, was looking around with her flashlight, uncertain of what else to do in this type of circumstance. My mom says we're never supposed to come this far into the woods, she said, shaking. Can we get out of here now? Moxie, are you sure you're okay? Diego said, holding her close, hoping to stop her trembling. Yes, let's go, Moxie said, shaking it off. She didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Surely someone was playing a huge joke on her, she thought, as she stood more strongly now. But why and who would do something like this? She had no answers to what seemed to her to be something so incomprehensible she had to put it out of her mind. 
I think I remember the way back, Diego said, moving out of the clearing towards the trees. Just follow me. I can smell our campfire, and I think it's back this way, he said, as Moxie and Amber moved in behind him. A few minutes later, they made it back to the forest entrance, and Moxie broke into a run just to get back to the fire and some warmth. Her mind suddenly went back to the wooden box, but it was nowhere to be found. She was kicking up dirt and on her hands and knees in the tall grass, searching for it. Hey, did you guys see what happened to that box? I think I dropped it when we heard that noise, she said, wondering what had happened to it. She recalled that the vision had said there was a gift for her, and her mind went back to the box. I think we lost it when we ran off, Diego said out of breath. To, to heck with it. We've all had quite a day. I say we turn in for the night. I've got a lot of chores left over for tomorrow that I didn't get to today. They all agreed that the day had been way more than each of them had expected. Diego disappeared inside his tent and slid gratefully inside his sleeping bag. Amber, realizing her plans might be dashed, went off to her tent in a huff. She sat on top of her sleeping bag and dug down inside her duffel bag, pulling out the magnum condom. She laid it next to her pillow and she slid into the sleeping bag, unsatisfied. Moxie stood outside her tent for a few minutes, looking up into the sky and wondering what had happened to her. She thanked God for keeping her safe and decided to call it a night. She moved into her tent and sat down in her sleeping bag. Something inside of it bumped her leg and she reached down inside the bag and then pulled back in shock. She reached her hand back into the bag as she slowly pulled out the wooden cross box. But how could it have gotten there? There was no way. Clearly, this was still a joke that Amber must be playing on her. <laughs> how funny, she thought, thinking of Amber laughing at how she had tricked poor Moxie into believing there was a haunting or something else more sinister going on here. She could feel that the edges of the lid were almost pried open. She used her fingers to move between the crack in the lid, and then suddenly the box opened and something glinted in the lamplight of her tent. She reached her hand in, and then she passed out. This is where we are going to leave it for now, and we will come back next for the next few chapters. The next chapter we come back with will be Edgar Returns, chapter five. So we'll see you all again next.